how could real estate in a virtual environment truly be worth something? Well, the value of the real estate is, is correlates directly to the passion and engagement of the community that participates in it. So if this community is really active and people are really putting a lot of their time, effort, passion into it, then that real estate will go up in value. It's my pleasure to welcome Stephen S. Hoffman to the show. He is chairman and CEO of Founders Space. He's coming to us from the San Francisco area. He is author of many books, including The Five Forces That Change Everything. But we are going to start off not talking about the five forces specifically. We're going to focus on one of them, especially as it relates to real estate and the economy and how many things will likely change around something we've been hearing a lot about lately. What is that? We're going to talk about the metaverse as it relates specifically to real estate and investing in the economy. Stephen, welcome. How are you? It's fantastic to be here. Thanks for having me. Yep. Good to have you. Good to have you. So first of all, maybe it's just fair to one sentence or so. What is the metaverse? What is the metaverse? So a lot of people are asking that question since Facebook changed its name to Meta and it's become a topic of conversation again. So the metaverse has actually, it's nothing new. It has been around a long time. So if you look at the metaverse, what it is, is think of virtual worlds. Virtual worlds have been around a long time. Virtual worlds are a perfect example of the metaverse. So VR, virtual reality, virtual worlds, it's kind of an encompassing term. So it's VR, virtual worlds, augmented reality, that's things going on on the blockchain, basically this whole digital space that is beyond what we, how we normally act today, like on our phones. So right. it's really talking about immersive digital environments. Okay, so many years ago, in the much earlier days of the internet, I started to hear a lot about something that just amazed me. It amazed me that people would spend money in a virtual world, and that was Second Life. Now, I never really participated in Se Second Life, but I, I was so fascinated that people would actually do this and buy real estate with real money in Second Life and these kind of places. So, you know, what's the big deal about Zuckerberg's announcement then? This is not a new thing, right? No, what, it's what's... been going on a long time. Yeah. So I was in Second Life. I went in there. I was trading stuff, creating stuff. Second Life was huge. It had an economy bigger than a, a lot of countries out there. It wow. was enormously pos popular. And then at a certain point, people moved on. They moved on to Facebook and other things. I was actually at that same time that Second Life was around, I was running my own virtual world. So I know about the metaverse. I've done it. You know, I've been an entrepreneur. I've run three venture funded companies, two bootstrap startups. I really understand this technology. And my metaverse that I was running at the time was called Rocket On. And it was literally, you could take avatars and walk across any website on the internet and meet your friends and meet other people and talk and chat and find you know treasures and all these sort of hmm. things. So I turned, I turned the entire World Wide Web into a virtual world. Now, Second Life was a 3D model, like you were immersed in this 3D world, people were making buildings, outfits for the avatar. And, you know, essentially, Mark Zuckerberg, he bought Oculus a while back yep. because he thought at a certain point, and we don't know when, it's had many, many false starts, as you can sure. see by Second Life actually growing really fast and then shrinking down to almost nothing. It's had many false starts. But at some point, we're going to move beyond the two-dimensional screen uh, into a world that is a 3D environment. And that 3D environment will will be online, definitely, like these virtual worlds that are all over the place, but it will also be in our normal physical environment. And we call this augmented reality, where we're mm -hmm. layering digital assets over the real world. And you can imagine it if you go into a home, right? And you're walking through a, a, a home. Right now, people are developing augmented reality apps for this, where you could literally walk through environments and you can see in the environment, 
different things that you wouldn't know about. So for example, if you're walking through a home, you could find out about the architecture of the home. You could find out when it was built. You can find out when additions and remodels were done. All that information could be encoded into an, a layer over reality. And you might be wearing a pair of glasses, augmented reality glasses, like Apple is about to release, or contact lenses in the future, or even potentially a brain computer interface. But it's going to get really interesting and this is why Zuckerberg made the move. Yeah, wow, that, that's interesting. You know, I always thought it, it would be fascinating, and I, I talked about this a long time ago, to see that virtual reality would be used by, say, firefighters. I mean, can you imagine the idea of entering a burning building, not being able to see anything, and then uh, doing it like the Apache helicopter that the military uh, uses these VR headsets, right? And, um, and you could go into that building and see where everything was in virtual reality, and that's how you would walk around, right? So there's certainly a lot of amazing uses and a lot of stuff that's going to happen. One of the things that Peter Diamandis said, or alluded to at least, is that it would put realtors out of business. Because who would need to go show a house when you could just see it in virtual reality? Now, I don't think that's true, but what do you think? I don't think it's true either, at least no. not in the near term, because yeah. people want to see a space. Like, you're going to live in that space. I tell you, there are people out there who are buying real estate right now online. They, yeah. they are not visiting oh, space. Oh, we've been we doing all, that we, for years. Yeah, yeah we, <laughs> and, and, and they never see the space. Right. And that's fine for some people. Yeah. A lot of times it's investors because yeah. they're really just looking at the data and the numbers. Yeah. And they're like, okay, I want to get that deal before it goes away. I don't want to fly across the country. But, but for a home buyer, it's different. You're more picky totally. when it's a personal residence. Totally. If you're going to live in the space, yeah. I think you're going to want to see it. For most yeah. people, 99.8% yeah. of the people are going to want to be there. So yeah. I don't think that's going away. You know, I run a startup accelerator called Founder Space. We have startups in our accelerator that have been working on this for a while, you know, actually touring homes through virtual reality headsets and, and seeing and walking through them want to visit the home. Okay. Right. It's a way of screening out homes you don't want to visit. Right. So you're like, oh, I'll just go online. It's very uh, fast and easy. I'll look at all these homes in 3D, take a walking tour of them, and you then can I can eliminate. decide. Yeah, I yeah. can decide if it's worth my time to drive over there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So how else will this change the economy, though? You know, like, what is Zuckerberg thinking is going to happen that there's going to be a lot more e commerce in virtual reality? Or I'm kind of wondering what the business is, or is he just Absolutely. going to keep showing us ads again in virtual reality? Yeah, well, he's definitely going to show us ads. We're not going to escape the, the Zuckerberg thing. And yeah. he's going to mine our data and he's going to sell our data. So uh, that's a big thing for him. Now, Zuckerberg, you know, I believe he changed his name for two reasons. Number one is he is seriously. Uh, concerned about being displaced by somebody he doesn't know yet. He doesn't right. really know the future. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know specifically what's going to take off, but he wants to hedge his bets. He yeah. wants to make sure that when it takes off, he's there. Like he, he's, he's a player in that game. So he's basically placing, he has so much money now, he can place these billion dollar bets yeah. ahead of time just to cover himself. The other reason he probably changed his name is to deflect attention from all the screw ups they yeah been all, all the all the bad press. I mean, yeah. Facebook so has, this is a great no way of getting of people scandals to, to change yeah. the dialogue around Facebook. So mm. you know, he's a smart guy. He, yeah. he he knows that he he totally messed up, and he's trying to now deflect yeah. that. Yeah. So, no, I, I I think that was that was pretty obvious for sure. But but tell us about the economy and the business models, not just for Meta or Facebook, but for everybody. How, how sure. will this change us? So, uh, right, we've seen a lot going on in the virtual world space for a while. So, like you said, virtual goods, they've been huge for a while. Take any game like World of Warcraft, where people spend thousands of dollars for a suit of armor or a character, you know, tens of thousands of, you know, and this has been going on for decades. So, people have been buying virtual goods. Now, the difference that we're going to see, the big change, is not really uh, just in, uh, that we have more deluxe virtual worlds that are richer and more immersive, but that combined with things like the blockchain, where people can actually, through NFTs, non-fungible tokens, you can actually own, easily own and trade digital assets online. You know, it's interesting that you brought that up because I was just about to ask you about NFTs. And since NFTs exist in reality, 
in the sense that they usually send you something that's maybe a Lucite block with a thing in it and the NFT is connected to the internet. And so it can change and evolve, which is kind of fascinating, like those digital picture frames, right? But in the virtual world, in the metaverse, owning that intellectual property is something you could actually charge for. I mean, what about a, an NFT art exhibit in the metaverse would people go to a museum in the metaverse? I, I think so. so. They're doing it. Yeah. It's happening. So yeah. real museums, like very famous museums around the world, are actually launching virtual reality tours of their mm -hmm. artwork. So that's that exists. So like instead of flying to Paris to go to the Louvre, you know, you can do a virtual tour of some of the paintings in the Louvre. Now, where it gets really interesting is when it goes beyond that, which is happening right now. So there are a number of startups out there currently that are doing this. They are selling art, NFTs, in virtual museums that exist on the blockchain. So people go there and they will view the paintings. They're a lot of times just purely digital art and they will buy them and they will own them forever on that blockchain. So this whole thing is, is taking place right now. And where it gets really interesting is it moves beyond art. So it's not just art. Actually, some of the biggest virtual worlds right now on the blockchain and the hottest, like they're, they're going crazy, are ones where you can buy real estate, literally virtual real estate. And people are spending real money on this. And I'm not talking about how much real money. I'm not talking about 20 bucks. I'm not talking about hundreds of dollars. I'm talking about not even thousands, like tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands uh, of now, dollars. Now, you know, I mean, one of the things that makes real estate valuable is obviously it's, it's very limited supply. But if it's virtual, there's no limit to the supply, right? Why would they spend that? And how would it be valued? I, I mean, are different pieces of real estate different prices? I'm sure they are. How would, so, how would so when we get them? into the economics of this, which you wanted to ask, you can create scarcity. There does not have to be a limitless supply. So in a specific virtual world that you create, you can limit the number of plots of real estate to develop and you can limit them permanently. Say, you know, we're only releasing a hundred thousand virtual acres, like that's it or a million virtual acres. So the price, but, can but there's, but there's an unlimited number of locations for these virtual acres i mean is it that people wouldn't be able to meet it why would they want to meet in one piece of, on one piece of virtual real estate versus another you know it's it's well, just let so, me tell you let me explain yeah it. it's, it's so it's, unlike it's, regular life <laughs> no but it it is unlike totally unlike regular life and totally like regular life mm -hmm. so in the world today different pieces of property are valued differently depending on what neighborhood they're in, depending right. on what city they're in, right? So in a certain neighborhood, the same property, the same size property could be worth, you know, twice, three times, 10 times as much. Sure. The same is true in a virtual world. So they set up these neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are in essence communities. So they, certain neighborhoods have really like, you know, Elon Musk may be going into one neighborhood and buying up a very, cool property and building it, you know, virtually building it, like hiring an artist to design it and build these cool structures in this property, that the value of that virtual real estate to be next to the in proximity to other high value properties, also the price rises. Because now I, it's hard for some people to understand, but let me tell you, a virtual world is just as real as the real world. If people believe it, if they value it that way. So we're all seeing, it's very hard for people to understand like cryptocurrencies, right? What is a cryptocurrency? What is its value? Well, within a certain communities, cryptocurrency has whatever value that community decides it has. And sometimes very significant value for sure. Well, the, the cryptocurrency market's like over a trillion dollars. Like yeah. it's, it's, so you're, you're asking me, can this virtual real estate be worth a lot of money? Well, the whole cryptocurrency market is, is, is insane. And some of these cryptocurrencies, you don't even know what they are. Like they were memes or jokes, you know, that, but then people coalesced uh, around A lot them. of that, though, to be fair, is just tulip mania. It's craziness. I mean, they're just, Honestly, it's just massive I totally speculation. Agree, but it's massive speculation. And the same thing is going on right now in these virtual worlds. It's an extension of that. And this is how I view it. Like, just so you can understand this tulip mania, and it can actually make sense to you, because on some level, it, it makes no sense to me at all. And on another level, I completely understand it. 
So the way it makes sense to me is what people have done today is that it's the gamification of investing. This is all just a game to the people playing. It is a game. They don't care. It's not like a real asset, like real estate in the real world. It's not like a stock that has a PE ratio and growth potential and you can get all these metrics. It is really a game. And these are young people. They're making lots of money because people money is flowing into this. And they're sort of playing a game with their money, betting on, on, on future things. And, and it's also a game. Like I want to get back to real estate. How could real estate in a virtual environment truly be worth something? Well, the value of the real estate is, is correlates directly to the passion and engagement of the community that participates in it. So if this community is really active and people are really putting a lot of their time, effort, passion into it, then that real estate will go up in value. And this, and you can see in the history of these virtual goods and virtual worlds, it's the same thing. When people valued Second Life a lot and they were putting lots of time yep. and it was the hot thing, that the value went way up. Okay, so you've you've got a lot of real estate investors yeah. listening right now. Yeah. How would one buy a piece of virtual real estate and make it more valuable? How would that happen? Do you like invite people to it and use it as a virtual event venue or I don't know. <laughs> you know, what no, do you so do? So my answer is pretty much what you do individually won't make a big difference. It'll make an incremental difference in the value. Like if you invite your friends there and hang out there, it'll make maybe a little difference unless you're famous. Like if you're famous, if you're Snoop Dogg and you bought a real estate instantly, the moment you bought it, you know, or you're Elon Musk and you buy it, it it's going to shoot up in value. You know, it, it, you know, Jack Dorsey's tweet, first tweet sold for millions of dollars uh, as an NFT on the blockchain. Why? Because he's Jack Dorsey. So yeah, you invite celebrities there and get them to hang out. You're, you can increase the value. Most people can't do that. Most of your investors won't know, you know, famous people to invite in there. The community itself, if you want to gauge the value and the potential, what people are doing is they're looking at the activity of the community. What are the trends? Are the prices going up? Are people engaging with this community? Is the community growing? Are people really active? These things will determine, at least in the near term, the trajectory of the value of that property. In the long term, we don't know. Right. But in the near term, you can you can speculate on that, put in your right. money and then just see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Well, it'll be really interesting to see this evolve. And I would imagine we're going to we're going to see some surprises that just shock us the way we totally. have with some of the NFTs that have sold as art and the way we've seen with the cryptocurrency world. So just go to the blockchain briefly and then I want to get to the five forces if we can. Because so, blockchain yeah. and real estate, you were about to talk about. Yeah, that. yeah. So I'm I'm neck deep in this stuff, and and it, it is crazy. I want to say one more thing about virtual worlds, and this is for the naysayers out there. I say, nah, it's just a fad. It's just going to go away. Blah blah blah. And I think for a lot of the cryptocurrencies and a lot of these virtual worlds, yeah, they are fads. They mm -hmm. will go, but the general trend will not change. And the general trend is this. And this is something I write about in my book, The Five Forces That Change Everything. The general trend is that we are investing more and more of our time into participating online in the right. digital space. Yep. And, that tr and the more we participate, the more we put into it, the more meaningful and valuable it becomes to us. So if you think that a virtual world isn't valuable to you today, well, it might not be. But in the future, uh, your identity, who you are, where, you know, and anything that reflects on your identity yeah. in the digital world could be more important to future generations yeah. than the physical world, right? It might tell instead of driving a Mercedes in the real world, I might not care, but I might really want a Mercedes in the digital world, right? To show that I'm successful and I would pay for that. So I'm just saying um, the, the trends are there. We're already seeing this with the time people spend on Instagram and Facebook and all these other applications defining who they are makes it, it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And so okay. you wanted to talk about the blockchain. You blockchain and real estate. Now, of course, I've done shows on the application for chains of title and so forth. Yeah. You know, with that, you have something that one of our, our clients told me about called the Oracle problem, because humans have to put in the data the first time around, right? And then it could be a contagion of bad data. You know, it's like the old yeah. saying, Gigo, so garbage AI in, garbage is, out, right? AI is only as good as its data. 
let's face it, right? AI isn't, isn't it's an algorithm. Well, we're not <laughs> talking about escape. AI now. We're talking about the yeah. blockchain, right? Okay, blockchain. Yeah. But um, at, at the end of the, you know, a lot of people are using AI for these things uh, to actually, as the intelligence behind them, like valuing property and all the stuff we saw with Zillow and all this right. stuff. You know, it's only as good as the data. Same true on the blockchain. The really interesting space on the blockchain now is the tokenization of physical assets. And one of those physical assets is real estate. So can you know, people are out there experimenting right now, and all these are experiments with can we tokenize real estate and allow people to trade it just as easily as you buy and sell a Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't have to, it's all on the blockchain. You don't have to worry about titles, any of this stuff. You can literally buy fractional ownership in lots of different properties and speculate on them and trade them really, really quickly. It really makes it really, really liquid. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the future of real estate? Yeah, it's interesting because if it's, you know, this is a new way to do syndications, for example, where people can easily own part of a property and maybe easily exchange their portion of it. And so I think that will create a more liquidity in the market. And uh, real estate has been historically illiquid. Now, in today's market, it's selling so quickly, so maybe it's not so illiquid as it used to be. But, you know, it still takes 30 days to close a transaction. It's a rather clunky asset class, which is one of the things I really like about it, because that gives a lot more stability than, say, a stock that you can trade with a mouse click. But more liquidity, I would argue that more liquidity is coming to real estate than previously. But you Absolutely. probably agree with that. The right? trend is there. So yeah. we we are, you know, uh, Picasso, uh, they've, you know, they do this fractional ownership of high-end homes and, you know, they're one of the players. They're not on the blockchain. They're just, yeah. but they are, but Did they're trying to Did you say Picasso? Pa, yeah, Picasso, Picasso. Uh, Picasso. Oh, Picasso. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I so thought you were Picasso. talking about the short-term rental management company. No, no, that's another one, Picasso. Yeah. And it's very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know there's two different ones. So um, yeah, but Picasso is, you know, they're doing fractional ownership. There's a lot of other people out there doing fractional ownership. That's been around a long time with timeshares and other things. But what we're going to see is this becoming even more liquid, more easily tradable. Like literally, you don't, it's a smart contract with the blockchain online. So literally you click a button, you own it. Then the next day or the next minute, you could click a button and you could sell it. And it's going to be, it's that easy. Yeah. Pretty crazy stuff. Okay. Let's shift gears now. And I really want to talk to you about the five forces that are changing everything. First of all, can you just tell us what are the, the five, the broad categories? And I know some have a lot of subcategories to them, but what are the broad five? Okay. The first one, which is uh, called mass connectivity encompasses the metaverse that we've been talking about, basically AR, VR, really interesting brain computer interfaces, connecting our minds to the internet, all that stuff. The second one is about biohacking, bioconvergence. So basically we're gene editing. We have decoded the source code for life. We can now create new species of plants and animals that never existed. Like we can create those, we are gods. Where will that lead humanity? And where will it lead us as a human race? When we edit our own genes, will we be living longer? Will we be changing who we are? All those questions I dive into. The next one is human expansionism. So we are expanding like into outer space, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. We're also expanding down into nanotech. And where, where is that taking us? You know, in quantum computing, where's, where will all these innovations lead us? The next one is artificial intelligence. I call it deep automation. So deep automation we're seeing throughout society in the real estate business, it's huge, right? Every, everything, every process is being automated. Big data is everywhere. It's transforming the industry and it, it will literally transform all of our lives. And then the final chapter is beyond deep automation, beyond today's what we call narrow AI into artificial general intelligence. And that is when we have an intelligence explosion. Literally, we start to build machines that are that can simulate human consciousness. Will they be conscious? I address these questions. Will these machines be smart? Right. What will it be like to live with a robot? That Th this is, the, is, is So this is the singularity, right? Singularity and beyond. Yes, yes. singularity and beyond. Okay. All, all those, and the five forces are happening right now. They're redefining everything we do. And what the book does is it puts, it, it ties them all together and shows you where different possibilities for us in the future. And it brings up 
both moral and ethical issues. Oh, that huge we, issues. Yeah, we need to discuss right now because this technology is coming fast. Right, right. So Ray Kurzweil talks about, you know, achieving singularity when a computer as powerful as the human mind is $1,000. And, you know, he was predicting at least that that was 2030. What do you think? I mean, when does this actually happen? So this is big the, stuff. These things are extremely hard to predict like exactly when it will happen. So I, I'm always, you know, Ray Kurzweil went out on a limb to pick a date, uh, very brave of him, uh, but honestly, nobody knows. So these uh, technologies, they tend to kind of go along at a linear pace, and then all of a sudden they'll hit an inflection point, and boom, they'll, everything will change, right. like overnight. And we've seen this, like AI that we're all talking about today, like it went along for decades and decades, like since the 1940s and 50s with not much happening, small progressions, you know, incremental progressions. And then all of a sudden it's changing the whole world. Yeah. Uh, same with transistors, same with everything. So all this technology, we're seeing it with virtual reality and augmented reality, like it keeps having false starts, but at a certain point, boom, <laughs> it'll reach that critical point where it'll change. When will singularity happen? Nobody knows. But I, we, we can almost predict with certainty that if our society keeps advancing, we will reach that point. Like we are going to reach these points. These things will happen, whether it's a decade from now, two decades, five decades. Um, we don't know. A really interesting example is like atomic energy. Literally, right before they discovered nuclear fission, there were top physicists in the world saying this will never happen. Like mm -hmm. it'll never happen. Right. And then the next day it happened. So uh, a lot of times these breakthroughs just come out of the blue. Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely true. So would you put yourself in the camp of Elon Musk? You know, he says that this is pretty scary stuff and could destroy us potentially. It's, AI could take over. It's like the Terminator movie, right? Is this a, a fear that we should be worried about? So it is scary stuff. But I think it's scary for a different reason than Elon Musk says. So Elon Musk is worried about this, this AI Borg literally taking over, becoming so incredibly smart, like 10,000 times smarter than us, that mm -hmm. we can't compete. We're like ants. And yeah. it decides it doesn't need us anymore and just right. gets rid of the human race. Yep. Honestly, that's pretty far in the future. That's, you, you, you know, you, unless we get this longevity thing worked out where we can live much longer, most of us don't need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. what, but what we do need to worry about in the short term is that this technology is incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful, like, like nuclear energy, right? And in the wrong hands, it could cause uh, incredible damage to our civilization, to humanity. Mm -hmm. And I, let me just give you a few examples so that it's concrete for your sure. audience. So number one, we've seen what AI can do already with deep fakes, right? Faking, uh, and, and it can make Obama appear lifelike, and it can recreate Obama's voice and image yeah. and make him say anything right on the eve of right. a political so, election. So if you have a video of someone committing a crime, I don't know that that should be admissible in court anymore because and we also know that human memory is really yeah. fallible too right? right so what's admissible in court what's admissible in right on the eve of a political election when they release misinformation yeah. with you know fake videos of people doing stuff or saying things that they didn't say and there's no time to counter that how do we authenticate different media types like what becomes real and what isn't real really a problem especially for a democracy yeah no, another area in a really, dictatorship, they don't have to worry about that stuff. No, they just, they filter it out, <laughs> right? But then that's the other area. So you look at certain countries now that are authoritarian, and they are literally using these AI algorithms to filter everything. Like to literally, uh, you know, you can't say anything without it going through an AI, and it's screening it out, and they're getting better and better and better. And not just filter stuff, but also AI and big data can manipulate people very easily. We saw this with Facebook and Zuckerberg, back to Zuckerberg acting irresponsibly, literally putting up misinformation on Facebook with the AI algorithms that propagate it based on engagement. You know, you could, if you don't control it, can get totally out of control and lies can actually damage people. Like they can, you know, hurt real, you know, the pizza restaurant where people, you know, guy stormed in with a gun to get a pedophile all based on misinformation online. The AI is going to amplify this and, and in the wrong hands, it can be abused. So we have to be very careful with these technologies because they are getting so powerful. Like they're literally um, 
able to create alternate realities and propagate them through the world. And there, the, you can measure things. So you can measure people's reaction to it. So if you put out a piece of fake news, let's say, you can see how people react to it. And if they react a certain way, you gather that data and then, and then you can reinforce that with other things. And it becomes a, a, an extremely powerful engine, <laughs> that, yeah. that, uh, a tool that people have in their hands um, that can be used to manipulate and control uh, large swaths of society. Yeah, all right. I agree. Okay. Uh, were those, is that it for your concrete examples? Or is there no, I have one? many more, but <laughs> yeah. I could go okay. on and on and on. Right. You know, all these technologies uh, have a, pos a light and a dark side. Yeah. So all of these technologies can literally make our lives so much better, so much easier, you know, make us live longer, make us feel better, help us make hard decisions, make businesses prosper, make abundance of, of, of food and services for everybody by bringing down the cost. And at the same time, all of these technologies have a very, very dark side. Yeah, right. No question about it. Okay, so what are the other forces? Just give us the, the broad overview. And I want to definitely talk about longevity. Okay, so let's dive into longevity, because um, we can go into that and then maybe brain computer interfaces, which are really cool. So okay. in longevity, we're making huge strides. So there are gene therapies out there now, that we are developing that have potential to literally blow through the, I think it's 125 years is the longest somebody has ever lived. So we could easily be getting to 150. Some scientists say we can't go beyond 150, but I don't believe it. Our bodies are just machines. And literally we're figuring out how these machines run. We're figuring out how to tweak our genetics so that we can actually reprogram our bodies so that you know, dying, dying off, was an advantage in evolution because you could get a new generation. You know, you want people to combine genes, right? You don't want overpopulation. You want people to be com combine genes, create a new version, always evolving and changing. Well, now we have evolution in our own hands. So we don't need to necessarily die off at a certain age. We can start pushing the limits. And there's different ways to do this. One is gene therapies. Those are coming. Uh, there, the other way is there are a lot of different drugs out there that people can take right now, and you can go online and figure them all out, like MNN, which you know it, it creates a NAD plus in your body, which is supposedly in animals like mice and rats. Okay, you have it. You take it. <laughs> I take <laughs> well, it too. I just got it. Yeah. Okay, I'm taking it too. I take that. I take metformin. Uh, that's a prescription drug, so you actually need a prescription for that. But there are a number of these. Uh, that have the potential to s not only extend your life, but also extend your health span, which is more important to a lot of people. Because you know, when you get old, you look at old people and they're always complaining about their ailments. <laughs> you know, yeah. be nice to live longer, healthier lives. Right. And we are going to see definite progress in this. Google is investing a huge amount of money. All these startups are investing a lot of money. So this area is ready, you know, Peter, Peter, who you mentioned before, Diamandis, he is investing a lot of money. Ray Kurzweil is totally into this. This area is, uh, this area, we're going to see some big changes. But like we said before, we don't know the exact date when these breakthroughs will happen. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so think about the wide ranging impacts of the lifespan going from, say, 75 years to 100 years on average to 125 years to 150 years. I mean, that's literally people living twice as long. So then what do you do with social security? What is the retirement age? You know, how do people we, rearrange their lives? The lifespan increases that have happened in the last century literally changed the way people marry. You know, before people wouldn't marry multiple times and divorce multiple times. Now they do because People have more choices, they change more over time, you know, they grow apart, right? So, I mean, there's just huge impacts. You know, what if people work longer? Will that increase the GDP massively if you have, you know, a much bigger workforce? You know, when you look at those population pyramid charts, 
And there are these certain lumps at certain points in the chart, right, where the population's either in their prime earning years or they're all young or they're all older. And that has a massive impact on the economy. For example, look at Japan, right? Japan has a, an older population and they don't have young people coming up to take their place. So they have a big problem with retirement and legacy and it's, you know, it's hurt their economy for decades. Absolutely. What, so, what happens with us? How do look, people rearrange their lives if they, if they live even 25 years longer, right? If the yeah. average lifespan is 100 years, that's a giant change. If it's going to have a massive impact on economies. And like you said, with Japan, South Korea, China, Europe, the demographics, they're all yeah. aging. Yeah, Western and, Europe, Russia, I didn't mention those, but yes. Yeah, it's like all. it's a global phenomenon. We're going to be hit in the United States too. Like we're just a little behind them. Yep. So, but Japan, it's literally dragging down their economy. Like their aging population, they don't have enough young people to even take care of the old people, let alone fill the jobs that yeah. they need to fill to keep their economy growing. They just don't. And because they're a country that really doesn't like immigration, they're having a really hard time. Right. Same with China. They don't like immigration. So they're like, they've shut all the doors. Um, and South Korea too. So what we're seeing is uh, in the first world, especially an aging demographic. And when people live longer, we will age more but we will eight, we'll be able to grow older, but we'll have to restructure society entirely. We may have to eliminate retirement benefits. Like we may have to throw them out the window. The good thing, and this is a good thing, is if we live longer, like you mentioned, uh, we may live longer, healthier lives. And if this is the case, we can actually be a productive member of society uh, during those extra years, adding to it. And also in the United States right now, what we're having a work workforce shortage. Like we don't have enough people to fill all the openings and jobs right now. Same in Japan, same in South Korea, you know, all these countries around the world, they're having shortages of workers. So workers living longer and being productive can be a very good thing. And think about it like you and me, right? We're not spring chickens anymore. Like we're, 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 you know, we're getting there, but we have a lot of knowledge. We have accumulated a lot of experience. We have a lot of relationships. We have a lot of ability to add to the economy. More, you know, they did a study of entrepreneurs out there, and everybody thinks it's the young entrepreneurs who are the ones driving all the value, you know, in the creation of new companies. Actually, the entrepreneurs who drive the most value tend to be in their 40s in their 40s. Why? Because they still have energy, like they're not like retired or not, not, not feeling bad. And they have all that knowledge they've accumulated. Right. The reason we see so many successful young entrepreneurs is just simply because there are more of them. They're more than willing to take the risk, take the plunge, do something crazy. Right. So, well, I mean, just, if you just look at the cohorts, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, you, you know, you can't even really say 40 anymore because millennials are 41 the oldest there millennials, you go. right <laughs> so really maybe you meant 45 or 48 yes. right and so those are gen xers that's my generation okay there's a lot less of those there's only about 46 million of those compared to 80 million millennials which is the biggest cohort and then the older baby boomers only 76 million or i mean not only but a lot that was the biggest generation until the millennials came along so you know there, there's just a lot more millennials there's almost double and, the number and right? They, it's much easier for them. They don't have families to support. They, right. They're not, you know. Yeah, so they, they're, they're not, willing to take more risk. Yeah, they don't, so they there don't are a lot more of them who try to yeah. be entrepreneurs. And right. it's just yeah. a numbers game. Like yeah. at the end of the day, you have more people trying, you're going to get more successes. Yeah. So, but what I'm saying is that, uh, and I write about this in my book, The Five Forces That Change Everything. Basically, in the future, aging, you know, they think the Earth's population is going to actually level off. Yeah. They're, they're oh, well, I mean, there's a there's a book called Empty Planet, and mm -hmm. it's, it's all about that. I mean, the population is really going to decline. We're going to start noticing this in about 30 to 40 years. There's just not enough people. Yeah, the growth, <laughs> the growth right now is Bill yet. Gates is going to get his wish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're, we're there's going to be a shortage of people. So we yeah. don't have to worry about people living longer or even potentially forever. And if Elon Musk succeeds and he wants to send a million people to Mars, we're yeah. going to need people to, <laughs> to go right. there. Yeah. And so I don't see 
that as a problem. I see the biggest problem is what we do, what we're doing to our planet to get there. <laughs> yeah. That is the bigger problem. Okay, so really, one of the things you said a few minutes ago is a good segue to the brain computer interface. Okay, and that's kind of back to the singularity concept to some extent, too. Let's wrap up with that idea. And just tell us what that means. I mean, Elon Musk recently demonstrated, well, I guess it wasn't that recent, maybe it was a year now, but the pigs with the brain interface and so forth. And a lot of people are pretty freaked out about this, maybe rightfully so, especially in an era of these big, disgusting tech companies that are censoring our thoughts and controlling what we see and think and know. I don't know. You know, what? Tell, yeah. so talk about, think about it. The big tech companies, they don't have access directly to our brains, but indirectly. Yeah, but they, they, they will have. And, yeah. And, but and right I doubt now, they will be good stewards of it. No. <laughs> they haven't so, been so far. No. And But what I'm saying is, uh, they've already figured out how to manipulate us to quite a degree with just yep. the simple technology that's on the web today. Imagine when they have access to our thoughts. Yep. And if you think this is science fiction, like it's not going to happen anytime soon, Facebook's working on it. They publicly announced they are developing brain computer interfaces and they are putting a lot of money into it. So they, of course, want access to your brain. Like, and they want you to be able to get on Facebook Messenger or Instagram or WhatsApp and send a text message just by thinking. That's yep. what Mark Zuckerberg wants. Right. Would that be a great convenience? Absolutely. That's why people will adopt these technologies. They won't adopt them unless they have provide a high degree of utility. So these, we're going to adopt these technologies because they're going to be so amazing, so wonderful. But at the same time, we have to think about what the potential is. So I like to give this analogy. If somebody hacks your identity online, they can steal your credit card information, your bank, your social security number, make your life a little miserable. It's happened to me a zillion times. Yeah. There you go. What if you have a brain computer interface and it's a two way interface and they right. can actually hack your brain? Like that is scary yeah. <laughs> because, and let me give you some examples. So in laboratories right now, we have monkeys with brain computer interfaces, right? And these monkeys can drive around in wheelchairs just by thinking they can feed themselves. We've even given these brain computer interfaces to people who have locked in syndrome where they're completely paralyzed. They can send text messages today in the lab. They can drive around in wheelchairs. They can control robotic arms. Pretty amazing stuff. What's really amazing is that um, I'm going to talk to two experiments. So one is that they had a rat and they had this rat with a, a chip in its brain and they had a human wearing a brain computer interface that's non-invasive, meaning it, it's, they don't put a chip in the person's brain. It's just, it's just a cap on his head. And he was able to control that rat moving through a maze, control that rat. So the, but the, the amazing thing is the rat didn't know it was being controlled. The scientists determined that the rat thought it was making the decisions of where yeah. to go. Now you can imagine if whether you have a chip That's in a your- good metaphor for what's happening today. Yes. Yeah. So there are a lot of rat, a lot of us are rats. We're being experimented upon. And in this technology is becoming incredibly powerful. Now we, because this technology is out there, they did another experiment too at Duke University. They had two rats and these rats were in different cages in different cities, but they both had a brain computer interface. They both were connected through the internet to one another. They taught one rat how to get food. It would press a certain button when a light went on and it could get rewarded with food. Instantly, the other rat knew how to do it. What does that tell you? Well, that's, you know, that's sort of like the old hundredth monkey theory, right? Except it's done with, with technology. Yeah, well, it, it tells you basically that we have figured out how to transfer information from one living organism's brain to another. And if they can do it with rats, we can do it with humans. So mm. the potential for these brain computer interfaces is absolutely astounding. Like we could literally, I could be connected to you and we could be exchanging information between us. Now they did another experiment, they call it the brain net, where they had three monkeys. Now each of these monkeys could only see 2D, but their goal was to move a cursor, an object in three dimensional space to a certain location and they would be rewarded with food. Now the monkeys independently but their brains were connected, figured it out, and they got better and better at it. They completed, completed. They didn't even know the other monkeys were connected. They were just able to do it. So it shows you that if all of our brains start to get wired together, we're going to create this super meta brain 
um, that will be able to do things even not that we're not even conscious of. We'll be able to solve problems and enable us to do things that we can't even imagine today. And yeah. we are going to be integrating that meta brain with AI, with the whole power of the cloud, all these AI processors, storage, all the information on the internet. Imagine the abilities that could give you as a person, learning languages, solving complex problems, making decisions that the brain can't process lots of data, very statistics. Right. We're really bad at that, but we could do that all in the cloud. Yeah, right. Creating no, it, it's so sad that there are evil people in the world because if there weren't, this could just be an incredible Absolutely. renaissance of of the human race. I mean, there's, just there's, totally. there's, there's just no limits to what is possible, but there will be people that abuse this. There will be companies that abuse it. And I think a lot of people will be afraid to use this kind of stuff, rightfully so, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm terrified to use it knowing what I know, <laughs> yeah. but I'm also fascinated. I want to tell you the good and the bad. So yeah. the good part is that all of us have been trapped in our own heads, right? Like you can feel pain, but I can't feel your pain. I can empathize with you, but I can't actually feel your pain or your happiness, or your sadness, anything, right? But if our brains are connected, that's just a signal coming into our brain. Right. We could literally potentially in the future feel somebody's happiness. You yeah. could share a moment with somebody like you've never shared, like you're one being. Wow. This, the, you know, this transcends any experience we've ever had. You know, it's fair to ask with the metaverse and, yeah. and, and this stuff, you, you know, don't laugh, okay? Because this is a, an industry that is always a leader in internet technology, but the porn industry. And also the dating industry, right? I mean, this is just going to have massive changes on all this stuff. I'm even wondering if people are going to have any human contact anymore. You know, maybe so much of this stuff is already virtual on social media and so forth, and with telecommunication. But you know, with with the metaverse, it takes it to the next level with uh, these interfaces. Really I, good, I mean, really, wow, really good point. Incredibly good point. So number one is we will get to the point where we can actually, you know, in your dream, you feel things, you see things. Our yeah. brains are capable of of basically visualizing and placing us in an environment that doesn't exist, like people hallucinate too on hallucinogenics, yeah. right? right? And it's real we will be able to stimulate the brain in the future at some point, not, not in the near future, but we'll be able to stimulate the brain to create alternate realities that literally can light up the nerves in any part of your body, make yep. you feel any sensation. I, I it, mean, we can see that happening on an fMRI, a functional yes, magnetic yes, resonance, yes. A functional MRI. Yeah. Okay. We know that that's basically a mind reading tool in essence. Yes. And they, in a, using fMRI at UC Berkeley, they've actually extracted I images from people's brains and literally videos, like what they're watching in their brain, they can extract those. So incredible. This, yeah. Wow. Capturing your dreams, capturing image, you know, anything you see, all this technology is in its infancy, but it's here. Like it, it, a lot of it works in this. And if you project into the future, it's going to be a really well, like you said, if people use this responsibly, if people are good, it can be transcendent experience. A, Sadly, experience. that's a giant if, my friend, but, you know. Well, yeah. it's a, you know, when Elon Musk says he's worried about AI taking over the world, I beg to differ. I'm not worried about a super smart AI taking over the world. I'm worried about how people use this technology. That's a much mm -hmm. more realistic threat that we are facing right now. Like yeah. people abusing this technology to manipulate and 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 control other people sure is yeah crazy stuff well give out your website and tell people where they can find you of course the books are in all the usual places yep so you can find me it's super easy to find uh founderspace.com that's my main website it's my startup incubator investment company so go to founderspace lots more content of mine is there you'll find tons of videos my book five forces that change everything it's on amazon everywhere else and you can also find me on LinkedIn. Just go, if you want to chat with me, just go to LinkedIn and connect. Excellent. Steve Hoffman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I've, it's been wonderful being here. Good having you.